Okay. But now you need to turn yours down. Okay. All right. Sorry about that, everybody. Now can people hear us? Yes. Very well. Yes. <laughs> people but on the Zoom can hopefully hear us. on the Zoom can hear us. I see some thumbs up up some places on there. So good. All right. Well, uh, good evening, everybody. Um, this is the celebration of life memorial service for my father, Jim Heitler. And um, we're going to be hearing from a number of different people and doing some different uh, readings and songs throughout. And uh, we're glad that we have the opportunity to share this with people. And actually, we're going to even be able to have some people share with us. We have been desperately trying to get some people to read for people who couldn't be here, but they're going to actually be speaking for themselves. So that's <laughs> really nice. And hopefully all the technology will work from here on in. So I apologize uh, in advance for the tiny print of the program. And uh, so hopefully all, you, all of you have either magnifying glasses or reading glasses or phones that can magnify things. Oh, and speaking of phones, please make sure that your phones are on silent. Yes, please mute your phone. I don't need them to be heard from during this program. So we're going to start off with a song that uh, is kind of tangentially related to my father, Jim. Uh, this is a song he liked a lot, and it's a song by Joe Jenks, uh, very much about Pete Seeger and his testimony in front of Congress uh, during the Blacklist. And uh, it speaks to our shared values within our family often, and then things that my father taught me to connect up music with social justice. And uh, Pete Seeger was a big part of that for our family. So uh, please feel free to sing along with this song and any other ones that you feel so moved to do. You've asked me here to tell you about my neighbors and my friends. To talk about the who and what, the where and why and when. Well, I won't tell you anything you don't already know. But if you'd like, I'll sing that list of songs before I go. Let me sing you a song. About the people that I love, the poets and philosophers, the workers and the wanderers, the ones who walk the picket lines, dare to stand and fight, and the ones who hold their babies close and run them through the night. Now you say it's un-American to do the things I do. Well, I sing for justice liberty and civil rights it's true but i say it's un-american to ask me how i vote how i pray or what i believe but here's a song i wrote let me sing you a song about the people that i love about the people that i love the poets and philosophers the poets and philosophers the workers and the wanderers workers and the wanderers Want to walk the picket lines, dare to stand and fight, and the ones who hold their babies close and rock them through the night. Well, if you want to send me to prison, I guess that's the way it'll be, because I won't feed you fodder or your paranoid machine. If the price of my silence is shackles, well, then fellas, take me away. I will live to sing again and rise with a brand new day. Sing again. Let me sing you a song about the people that I love. About the people that I love. Poets and philosophers, workers and the wanderers, the ones who walk the picket lines, who dare to stand and fight, and the ones who hold their babies close and rock them through the night. Yes, the ones who hold their babies close, rock them through the night. So um, David put together a slideshow of Jim Heitler and his family and friends. So uh, mostly family, I think. So anyway, he is going to share that with you now. Thank you. 
ますか
sang Beatles songs in his sweet face. When I was a baby, there was music all around. I slept in a warm guitar case. Family harmony, come let's all gather round. Family harmony, oh what a beautiful sound. When I was in high school, I sang with my friends, my dad helped us harmonize. When we finally got it, we couldn't help but laugh, that sound was such a sweet surprise. sons. I love the way our voices blend. One day I hope to sing with my grandchildren too, so the harmonies will never end. Family harmony, come let's all Okay, David, have we taken care of all the technical details? Am I audible? Okay, David, how are we doing? Am I audible? Echo, 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 echo. Well, let's see. I'll just keep talking. Um, nice to see all you people. Um, I wish I could see the, uh, I see all the Zoom attendees. Um, one of these days, David, you have to show us a shot of the live audience. How am I, you tell me when to start, okay? Go ahead, Dick, go ahead. Very good. Well, I am so sorry that I can't be with you today in the flesh, but I am so glad and so grateful to David and Jenny and Margot and Esther for arranging this gathering of the Ann Arbor crew for a celebration of the life of my brother, Jim. Many of you have known Jim for a long time, but really, since you only met him in graduate school or later, I hope you don't mind me talking a little bit more about Jim's earlier years. Jim was an extraordinary boy before he became an extraordinary man. Jim was my big brother, the person I looked up to and tried to emulate. And this wasn't easy because he was such a tough act to follow. Jim, even when he was very young, was a person of many talents. You heard some of the great performances of the Ann Arbor Brass Quintet, but long before that, Jim played first trumpet in the Oceanside High School Band, where he was a featured soloist at the annual concert. 
I can still see him in my mind's eye, standing up in the spotlight, playing deep in my heart from the student prince as an unaccompanied stand-up solo. In addition to that, he also had a band, the Swing Kings, that actually made money doing weddings, bar mitzvahs, sweet 16s, and other parties while he was still in high school. In college, he played guitar and sang with a trio called the Davis Street Wanderers. And you heard some of them um, behind David's slideshow. And I, I see Dave, Dave Labman, um, a member of that trio in the Zoom audience here tonight. And it, it, it's great that you could be with us. I uh, Even before tonight, I had a chance to listen to some of your old tapes and they were really good folksy stuff with creative instrumentals and beautiful close harmonies. Um, you might also know or not know that Jim was a pretty good athlete. He was an outstanding catcher on his little league teams, managing the pitchers and calling the plays. And in high school, he was a varsity tennis player. And on top of that, he was voted best looking boy of the Oceanside High School class of 1960. Lots of girls had crushes on him. And he was, it must be said, a little vain. I have a copy of his high school yearbook photograph. It was in David's slideshow, but the copy that I have is one I treasure. He didn't like his haircut in that picture. So he got a pencil and adjusted his hairline. He did it so skillfully that my mother never noticed, even though it hung on the wall for decades. Jim combined an exacting aesthetic sense with real artistic ability. Even back then, Jim was an exceptionally talented paper, painter. He worked mostly in oils as a kid, but he let that talent lapse during his middle years when his time and attention were consumed by family and career. He returned to painting in his later years, and I like to think I had something to do with it, since my gift to him on his 65th birthday was a big box of painting supplies. I have never gotten more pleasure and satisfaction in return from any gift that I have ever given. Jim gravitated towards watercolors, even took some lessons and got quite serious about it. And when Parkinson's took away his trumpet and guitar, painting became the major focus of his artistic expression. There are some of the paintings in the room. I can see that tonight at Ann Arbor on the back bench. And we have some of them hanging in our apartment here in New York and also in the house that we shared in Florida. I treasure these paintings. They remind me of Jim in such a beautiful way. They are examples of his artistic vision, his color sense, his love of life, his exacting perspective, as well as his determination. Aspects of his inner athlete remained with him also. He became a devotee of spinning for Parkinson's, working out on an exercise bicycle several times a week. I am convinced that this helped control his tremor, but perhaps more importantly, he got to record several personal best times as his skill on the stationary bike increased. That determination and courage will always be an, in an indelible part of my memories of Jim. Parkinson's is a cruel disease, but the amazing thing is that Jim never complained. Whenever we got together in France or in Florida or in Ann Arbor, he was always upbeat, ready to go places and try to do things that became over time increasingly difficult. But I treasure our small victories together, like the way we figured out how to get his walker out onto the hard sand at low tide so that he could still take a long walk along the beach on Longboat Key. We came home from that walk elated, both of us. My heart goes out to Esther and David and Margo and to all of our extended family. Along with them and you, I am still grieving the loss of Jim, but I remain grateful for the time we had together. He will always be my big brother. 
I learned so much from him, and I will continue to look up to him and try to emulate always his zest for life, his drive and determination, his courage, and his essential dignity. Thank you. Wait, did I unmute? Yes. David, you need to turn on the microphone. No, he'll, he'll get that one for you. Okay. Okay. So, some of what I have to say will be new to most of you, and some will be familiar. I want to go back to the beginning of the story. On August 6, 1961, my first quarter of Antioch, there was a demonstration in remembrance of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Students donated their meal tickets to relief efforts in Japan and gathered in a long line in the center of the Antioch campus, which was at that time in its heyday. Jim and I both participated in this demonstration. We did not meet, but he later told me that he had seen me in the, in the line with my green toenails. Not a common sight in 1960. The first time we did meet, I was babysitting for friends of Jim's, whom he knew through his passion for folk music. I later learned that on their way to the movie in Yellow Springs, he had asked his friends to ask him to walk the babysitter home. <laughs> that is what happened. And we ended up in a door of common room, talking long into the night. We found that we had so much in common and were immediately attracted to each other. Our first sort of date was two weeks later when we boarded a bus to Washington, D.C. to take part in an anti-war demonstration. It was winter and slushy and thousands of people were there. One of many such things we did together in the early years. After that, we never really considered anything other than that we would be together for the rest of our lives. In the summer of 1962, as we started planning for the junior year abroad in France, we decided to get married before we left rather than later. I was 19 and Jim was 20. We had the most amazing experiences during that year in France. And both of us fell in love with the area around the University of Vézinson. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> In the summer of 1964, we traveled by camping with our new VW bug all the way to Istanbul and back through the socialist countries. We were drawn back to France and managed to go every other year from 1993, when we stayed in Arbois for two weeks. Jim loved France and the French and worked on his French to keep it up actually after we bought the house in 1995. He read my grammar books cover to cover and would check to see if I knew things he discovered. He had so much enthusiasm for the things and people who loved him. In fact, he loved France and Arbois and being there so much that he decided he wanted to retire early in 2006 at the age of 64 to be free to spend three months at a time instead of one. In 2020, he kept asking me to check with the French embassy to see if there was a way we as Americans could go to France and was very disappointed when the answer was no. In 2008, 2009, Jim had two serious biking accidents, accidents which seemed in retrospect to be related to balance and judgment. He loved biking, was proud of being able to climb up seven kilometers near our house in Armois and return on another route. But after 2009, he sold his bike to be safe. 
He had tests, but his Parkinson's was not detected at that time. Many of you know about the various diseases he had to deal with, some from as long ago as 1969. Through all of it, Jim was proactive, followed doctor's recommendations, tried everything he could to stay healthy. He kept on enjoying social activities and his growing passion for water. Never quit trying to stay the healthiest he could. Above all, he loved his family, his two wonderful children. And the six fabulous grandchildren. <clears throat> he loved his parents, was always generous in his time for them, his brother and sister-in-law, and nieces and nephews and his cousins. He would say to me, <clears throat> The best use of my money is getting together for family reunions. On July 6th, 2020, we celebrated our 57th anniversary. COVID time, but we went to the Gandhi Dancer, which had often been the choice for that celebration for years. As it turned out, we were all alone in the long, narrow room, which overlooks the tracks and felt safe. It was too hot to eat outside. In Jim's last two months, all his exercise and various medications came together and he was doing really well. He walked a mile the weekend before he died without stopping to rest and at a good pace. He ate and slept well. And he insisted on restaining of six dining room chairs on the last Monday. His death on October 7th came as a complete shock. When I came home alone, at 2 a.m. from the hospital and saw those chairs, I said to myself, he left me a gift. Actually, I have to conclude that he and his partner for life was the greatest gift. All right, we're gonna hear next from, well, we heard from uh, Brother Dick, we're gonna hear from Dick's wife, Mar. Right here. There you go. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, Esther, that was beautiful so far. <laughs> I'm just sitting here doing what I usually do when I think about Jim. Sighing a lot. Um, I'm missing Jim, and but I'm getting used to think of thinking of him in an eternal way a way when death is accepted as a finality, a new form of life begins. It's in the memory and a codification or perhaps a distillation of a person's life, his essence. Each family member mourns at their own rate in their own way. But I think we all have this to look forward to, a time when Jim is still missed yet extremely present and vibrant within us. I keep worn out snapshots of my parents in my medicine cabinet. Every morning I say, good morning, and there is no sadness. I say, thank you for letting life pass through you to me and onwards to my children and grandchildren. In the same way, I say to Jim, thank you for letting your life flow into mine. I know one day, I will need your courage and I will have it because I hold you close. Stop doing the technical things and the other things. Um, Okay, I think it's time for another song. What are you doing? Yeah. Uh, so we're going to do a song that um, I learned from Jim and David. And um, it's Dark as a Dungeon. We used to sing it in three-part harmony. And I remember at one point when my kids were really little, <coughs> we kind of surrounded them and sang this song. 
it was a time when our kids like to do a kind of interpretive dance with the miners' helmets to this song too, which was very amusing. So please help us sing it. I know some of you know it. Dave Lehman can uh, sing and play along. That's it. Come all of you people, so young and so fine, and seek not your fortune in the dark, dreary mind. It will form as a habit, and seep in your soul, till the stream of your blood runs as black as the gold. For it's dark as a dungeon, and So I recently was at another memorial service, um, somebody I didn't know actually, and I got a couple ideas from that that I liked. And a friend of mine wrote this song, which I thought we could actually read because I haven't learned to sing it, uh, but also because I think it's actually kind of nice as a, a spoken thing. So this is by Zoe Mulford. It's called Songs Stay Sung. And if you can manage to squint at the tiny print in your program, you could join in on the bold part each time if you want. There is an end to everything the breath we take and the songs we sing, and the last note rings and dies away, but the song stays sung till the end of days. And all we do may be undone, but love stays love and song stays sung. Love stays love and song stays sung. Astronomers could never chart the constellations of the heart, for lovers part and lovers pine but the love stays loved till the end of time. And all we do may be undone, but love stays love and song stays sung. Love stays love and song stays sung. And every life's a brief bright spark that dies and seems to leave no mark. So we curse the dark and we mourn the flame, but the things it showed us still remain. 
and all who do may be undone, but love stays loved and song stays sung. Love stays loved and song stays sung. And I've been told that we are made of dust cast off when stars decay, and the bodies fade that once were ours, but the dust goes on to make new stars. And all we do may be undone, but love stays loved and song stays sung. So next we're going to hear from a few of, of Jim's longtime close friends, starting with Jeff Urist. So this is my first experience with the celebratory memorial. They don't do this in much. <laughs> um, but uh, it's not the first time that I've considered the benefits of such celebrations. So I thought I'd start before I talk about any specific members of Jim, I start with celebrating the celebration. Um, there's an old joke that uh, Jews don't drink because it's a, it doubles the pain. Um, <laughs> and from that perspective, a celebration like this is, I think, easily reduced to keep on the sunny side of life. But it's much more than that. Um, what I really resonated with is that piece that they just read. Um, I experienced Jim as a big brother to me from the very beginning. Um, in fact, um, years and years later, um, my wife and I visited Florence in Florida. In Florida, really showed us around Sarasota. It was very serious, devoted way, in the same way that Jim and Esther showed us around the lot when we visited them there. Um, and Florence and George were doing their uh, their well-deserved shtick on aging and memory loss in old age. And a little bit later in the conversation, I brought up with Florence that uh, Jim and I both considered each other brothers of a different mother. But she struggled a little with that concept. And got that uh, I wasn't saying that I was one of her sons. But, uh, she got it and she laughed and she said, well, I would have remembered if that were true. <laughs> <laughs> so the end of her story started with graduate school. And that's where Jim became my big I was a first year student, excited to learn um, what I didn't know when I had no idea what I didn't know. Um, Jim was a few years ahead of me in the program. Um, and in a way that carries through in the way we play music together, the way we, we bike together, um, the way we talk about Obama and his paintings together. Um, Jim was a generous teacher to me 
at a point where I think he knew much more uh, about what I didn't know than even he knew. But uh, there was a, uh, I think, a strong tendency in my graduate training to teach us to be such good diagnosticians that when our patients arrived in our office, we knew exactly what to do. And Jim was the first relational therapist I ever had contact with because he kind of uh, sort of gently smiled about that. And based on his experience, you really never find out what's possible in psychotherapy until you figure that out together in terms of what the goals are and how to get there. It's not something that a therapist just dispenses to his or her client. And this kind of wisdom, I would say, was it wasn't just that he was a smart, talented guy. I keep coming back. In a celebratory way, to the, the, the generosity that he extended to me. He invited me to sit in on uh, uh, playing music together. Uh, I really admired a sense of where the music came from in jail. This idea of songs of protest and hope captured an integration that I think is getting harder and harder for us to uh, keep held in our minds as things that can coexist between us and the world. That was where Jim's music seemed to emanate from him. So I, I had some prior experience performing with my guitar. And I knew a lot of the songs. I knew a lot of the chords. I knew all of the words. I knew all of the words to Dark as a Dungeon. Um, what I didn't have was the ability to hold harmonies in my head which is something Jim did effortlessly, um, as well as hearing my struggle as a melody. Um, so it was uh, a loving experience to be invited by Jim to be part of his music. Uh, I had a similar feeling uh, I can take a lot of photos, you know, a lot. Um, Jim thought about uh, his projects for watercolors and to move from his plan. We talked together about how that worked out. And, I, you know, I think his paintings are beautiful and his uh, ability to find in his painting a way to keep on keeping on is something we're celebrating in all of us. So I resonate very much with the idea that uh, our friendships like this, if they're lucky enough to happen and become part of us, which I think is the answer to grief and becomes part of effective grieving. I've learned a lot from Jim about uh, keeping on, keeping on. We celebrated his talents and his friendship and his loving relationships every birthday, thanks to Esther. Uh, and we weren't allowed to bring gifts, and of course, we all brought gifts, um, but we were told not to. And 
uh, one year I gave Jim a uh, camping land. I wrote a note that said some of what I'm telling you about. Uh, but he tells a lot of things for me. And uh, he read the card to himself and he said, I'll put this over here because it's going to make me cry. Mm -hmm. that's, that's me. Thank you. So, uh, another great long time friend, Ivan Sheriff, is going to come up. I, I wish I could be as articulate and spontaneous way as Jeff just was, because there's so many things I remember. I can't remember them all, I'm afraid. Anyway, I'll read to you what I wrote. Uh, Jim, and I, Jim and I met in the early 70s. I had recently returned to the States from living in England. For four years, where I obtained child and adolescent psychoanalytic training. Jim and I were both psychologists, and we had common friends in Ann Arbor. He asked one of them to introduce us to each other. We were close in age. I was several years older. We both had two children, a boy and a girl, and we were both married to accomplish women. It was clear our early backgrounds were very discrepant. Jim's father was a high-level executive with a major company. I can't remember, I think it was health insurance. Jim grew up living on Long Island. My father was a truck delivery man for a New York City Jewish bread company. He woke at 4 a.m. to load the truck and make his deliveries to restaurants and stores in Manhattan. He had an eighth grade education and he immigrated from England at the height of the Depression. My understanding was that Jim had a Jewish background, but his family was non observant and were members of the Ethical Culture Society. While my father was from an orthodox background in England, the working realities in the States required him to work on the Sabbath. So we weren't observed. I was bar mitzvah, though, in a reformed synagogue, but I'm mainly non observed. What Jim and I had in common was an interest in psychoanalysis and applying its concepts the treatment of people needing help with various neurotic conflicts. I recognized early that Jim was a very cultured individual, well acquainted with classical and folk music. I was an accomplished trumpet player and later a guitarist as well. I, on the other hand, was uneducated in classical and folk music. I was a devoted fan of Frank Sinatra and Nat King Cole. <laughs> Despite my ignorance about classical and folk music, I did appreciate them, and I never experienced that Jim felt superior to me. There was a quality about him. You know, he was modest about his accomplishments, which were many. I mean, we just got a glimpse of some of them. Jim and I would meet weekly from the 70s until his death. We'd meet for lunch every week. This was interrupted later when he retired, and Esther and Jim spent winter months in Florida and summer months in France. They were both very generous and invited us several times to spend time with them in both locations, which we did. And we had great times. 
very valuable. <clears throat> Jim was left leaning his political views, as was I, and often we discussed national politics, both being critical of existing administrations in Washington, D.C. I can just imagine if Jim were alive now, how much he would have to say about the current situation. We also devote lunch times to discuss pressing clinical issues, some with a particular patient. We were very protective of the identities of our respective patients and my analysis. When our kids were younger, our families would go camping together in Michigan. Jim and Esther were helpful in educating Judy and me about the complexities of camping, and we were very appreciative. Jim was someone I highly valued as a friend. He was a decent man who was not given to prejudices. He was a devoted husband and a father and cared about the welfare of others. I would characterize him, excuse me, as a mensch. I miss him and this friendship, and I am pleased I have fond feelings which nourish me. Thank you. We hear next from Army Ballot. And he's going to be on Zoom for us. Can you all hear me? Or, yep. Okay, good. Hi. Uh, <clears throat> sorry, I can't be there. I had intended to. Um, Jim was a special person and a wonderful friend. He was very ca caring, kind, and helpful. I mean, these are just words, but they're not just words. They they were what he was like. Excuse me. <clears throat> I was hearing an echo from Ellie, so I had to turn it down. Um, what was unique about Jim is that he lacked the usual kind of narcissistic self-importance, which most of us struggle with. I'm sure that this kind of lack of competitiveness is what made him the great father I knew him to have been and the good friend he was to me and others. Ellie said to me of, of Jim that he didn't have an envious bone in his body. And I think that's true. But it's like because of that, he was the kind of person one would envy, I would envy. He seemed genuinely satisfied with life. He not as driven as many of us are. And in that way, when he talked to me and others, you really felt he was thinking about you and concentrating on what you were saying. He was genuinely pleased when something good happened to me, genuinely sympathetic when one of life's misfortunes came my way. He was a very talented therapist, very astute about human relationships, and filled with many insights about problems that we as therapists ran into. <clears throat> Here's how I met him. It was in the very early years, also in the 70s, of uh, our move to Ann Arbor. Of course, Jim and Esther had been here before because of his graduate training. Ellie and I were invited over to their house for dinner. Earlier that week, I had received a call that my analyst had suddenly and unexpectedly died. I was sort of numb. At dinner that evening, Jim mentioned to me that he was under some kind of stress because his analyst had suddenly and unexpectedly died. I thought they're dying like flies. What the hell is going on? Of course, a little later in the conversation, I found out that we shared the same analyst at the time. For those of you who are curious, it was Ira Miller, by the way. Phew, as bad as it was, it was just a one-off. But I'm sure that played a role in our bonding. Later, I found out that we also both loved Halibah, 
so that sealed the deal uh, uh, and bonded us for forever. We had so many interesting discussions about psychotherapy, psychoanalysis, music, politics, family, and so on. And I've missed all of that since he died. David, I think the presentation you put on is just wonderful. It reminds me of many things. You know, I remember listening to the brass quintet. I remember the house in France. I remember his father singing Old Man River. The birthday dinners of Jeff Yurst, Jeff and Rachel, Judy and Ivan, Ellie and me, and uh, Esther serving lobster. Um, his trumpet playing, uh, David's trumpet playing. He, even though he was kind and gentle and caring, he didn't hold his punches if required. Once Jim was over at our house and Gay Rosewald and I were practicing some four-handed piano piece, we asked Jim to listen and to offer his observations. By the way, no, we didn't ask for his criticisms, just his uh, observations. We wanted praise. <clears throat> I was playing the secondo part, uh, meaning I was on the lower half of the piano and Gay was on the upper half. He, after we were done, he said positive things about the piece and then came the comment I didn't want to hear. I think it's a little out of balance. The second secondo part should be a little softer. <laughs> Damn, I knew I had been pounding unmusically on the keys, but hadn't really wanted to face that. It took hold from then on and I worked very hard uh, to make it more musical. When David asked me if I would speak today, I told him that when I think of Jim, I go back and forth between feeling sad that we lost him and glad that I knew him. I still go back and forth between both. One thing for sure, I miss him. Thank you. All right, so this is a little bit awkward uh, because some of it's about me. It would have been better if somebody else could have read this one. But uh, my friend Ross Thayer, uh, who uh, I did a lot of music with as a high school student, uh, wrote this remembrance of my father. David and I met in high school. We were attracted by our deep mutual love of music. I was amazed by David's vast knowledge of all things musical that he had gotten from someone. See, I told you it was embarrassing. From someone. That would be his father. Okay, good. quickly we turn to him. Um, we would play and talk about the Beatles and pretend that we were harmonizing like the Everly Brothers. When David invited me to his house to play some music, I was so very heartwarmed to find that the invitation was not simply to a house, but to a home. Beyond my new friendship with David, I was welcomed by Esther and Jim with the deepest and most sincere hospitality and generosity. I immediately came to admire and love this strong, loving family. And Jim became an immediate friend, mentor, teacher, and dare I say, surrogate father figure to me. He was full of grace and exuded a natural and mature poise, simultaneously unimposing yet commanding. Often was the occasion when David and I would be working out our two-part harmony parts to some Pete Seeger song or maybe Lead Belly. David introduced me to a wide and diverse musical repertoire. And Jim would gently sidle up to us and add his voice. How can I describe Jim's singing voice with due justice? Of course, a lot of you know what it's like, but uh, it would be like attempting to describe Michelangelo's fresco on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel to a blind person. Trust me, it's beautiful. It just doesn't suffice. Jim's rich and sonorous bass voice never failed to arouse the goose flesh. And beyond his innate musicality, Jim was always available to provide serene words of wisdom from his unfailingly calm presence. Some years later, I was at one of life's major crossroads. I desperately wanted, needed to make a change, and I had decided to go back to school to get a degree in psychology. I had zero experience and no related references. 
getting accepted into a graduate program was a long shot, but I did have the audacity to ask Jim for a reference letter. I knew that this was presumptuous, but I was desperate. I knew that shy of any relevant vocational or educational experience, Jim would only be able to speak to my character. So there I was asking for a character reference from the very paradigm of character. All of you here who knew him can give testimony to Jim's profoundly admirable level of character, humble intelligence and compassionate empathy. Jim graciously wrote that letter and surely played a pivotal contribution to my admission. I graduated and have been practicing therapy for 23 years. A few more years of practice, and I hope to be good at it. <laughs> Jim, on the other hand, uh, I don't need to hear any testimonies from any of his patients to know how revered and impactful he must have uh, been to, in so many lives. One only needs to have had the pleasure of meeting him to know. And I consider myself so very blessed to have had Jim Heitler in my life. I love the man. I also wish to convey my love to Esther, Margo, and David, and to all of you, Jim, the consummate family man, called his family. While it is truly a sadness to have lost Jim, may the legacy of his life and memories continue to sustain and, and nurture your family as he has mine. Love, Ross. So I'm going to sing a song, which is probably very foolish to attempt to do, because I wrote this song for my father, and I hope I can manage to do it. I remember a time when I was a kid, I dressed up in my dad's clothes. His suit jacket hung down like a rope, the tie reached to my toes. And his shoes so kind of like clown feet, I tried to walk but I took a spill. I wondered if I would grow tall like him, his shoes were too big to fill. My dad's shoes. My dad's shoes, my dad's shoes, they're such big shoes to fill. My dad would sing songs, play his guitar, and started teaching me. My fingers were so small next to his, it didn't come easily. But as time went by, we would harmonize and sing his songs, old and new. And I don't think either one of us guessed would be to what I do. My dad's shoes. My dad's shoes. My dad's shoes. They're such big shoes to fill. The trumpet he played in high school bands hung on our living room wall. When the band conductor asked what I choose, I didn't have to think at all. And we played duets, sitting side by side, his tone was bold and strong. And now this old trumpet is in my hands, and plays a mournful song. My dad's you, my dad's you, my dad's you. Such big shoes to fill. There's so many ways, too many to count, that make me who I am. I'm just a living legacy to the leader of the band. And I can't believe that he is gone. Everybody loved my dad, Jim. I know that he was proud of me. Sure, I'm proud of him. My dad's shoes. My dad's shoes. My dad's shoes. They're such big shoes to fill. All right, so my mother is not the only person who has a lot to say about my dad and who doesn't want to say it herself. So Jenny is going to read what Margo has written. I might have to turn your mic on. Hold on a second. All right, try it. See if it works. Nope. There you go. 
Before I read what Marco wrote, I'm going to tell you one very short um, anecdote. So David and I met when we were at Oberlin College, and we were just starting to go out. I wasn't totally sure, you know, how serious I was about this relationship. I and, was. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, David's parents happened to be coming for a visit, and I met them, and I was like, wow, you know, they're like, really young and good looking and hmm, maybe under that long hair and that big beard. <laughs> it's good looking too. <laughs> so anyway, they made a very favorable impression on me and then I became more serious about it. <laughs> All right, so this is from Marco. Thank you so much for coming to celebrate my dad with us this evening. Not a day goes by that I don't think about him. And sometimes now, after more than a year and a half, I can even do so without crying. Today will not be one of those days, however. One overwhelming sentiment that people have expressed to us about my dad is what a great listener he always was. People felt he was very present and interested in what they were saying. Of course, his profession fit well with this gift, and I'm sure was a main reason he chose his career in the first place, or it chose him, whichever the case may be. One of my favorite quotes that I have at work stresses the importance of this. If we were meant to talk more than listen, we would have been born with two mouths and one ear. <laughs> I chose my career largely because of my dad, and I have always consulted him about work and personal issues with the kids. I find myself thinking now, what would he do in this situation? And what would he say to me if I asked his advice? He always seemed interested in the kids I was seeing. He was constructive and thoughtful, which are traits I very much admire and try to emulate. I can't even remember hearing him say anything negative or judgmental about anyone he met. Another quote I have always liked that helps me take a deep breath and deal with change is the branch that bends survives the strongest winds. My dad was indeed bending with the weight of Parkinson's on his shoulders. However, he never complained and he never gave up. He did everything anyone recommended, went to all the doctors he could, biked at the YMCA, exercised at home and continued to do all he could for himself. My mother made sure he kept up with a busy social calendar as well, which I'm sure was a good thing. He continued to paint until the day he died. I look at all the paintings around my house and in all of my children's homes with great appreciation and pride for how talented he was. When I think about my dad, I think of kindness, which is something we could all use more of in our lives. My dad rarely got mad. He held no ill will against others. And he was truly liked by all who met him. I have so many happy memories that I cherish, as I'm sure many of you do. So I made a list of some of the loves that we shared and some of the phrases that will be forever Jim isms. I'm sure some will sound familiar. He always said, There is no such thing as too sweet. And he and I certainly loved our desserts. We had very similar tastes and both loved flourless chocolate cake. Reese's peanut butter cups, which Ellie gave to him every year for his birthday, cheesecake, cream cheese frosting, creme brulee, praline pecan ice cream, anything with caramel or peanut butter, and any cookies made by yesterday. <laughs> no dinner was complete without having dessert. We both loved to eat in general, and he did not believe in dieting or depriving oneself of anything. Instead, he always said everything in moderation. We liked many of the same foods and would often order scallops and risotto or lobster ravioli, anything with a cream sauce, hot sandwiches instead of cold ones, and conte from France. And if you're hungry, there's going to be some refreshment. <laughs> <laughs> um, he also used to say, sun and salt water cure everything. And we made many opportunities to test out this theory in Jamaica, Antigua, Florida, and many other beautiful places. We both loved walking on the beach, taking family vacations, attending family reunions, 
picking apples at the apple orchard and traveling. When we travel, we always tell my brother and I to look up so we wouldn't miss the beautiful paintings, stained glass windows and architectural features of the places we visited. I think he would have loved a career as an architect or a landscape artist, but he was able to channel these interests into his paintings. And finally, as you know, music has been a huge part of our lives. I played the flute for 13 years and my dad never missed a performance at school or solo and ensemble competitions. I played duets with him on the trumpet or the guitar and I love listening to him sing. I love growing up with folk and bluegrass and there are many songs that reminded me of him. Later, I enjoyed introducing him to many of my favorite artists, including Jason Mraz, Jack Johnson, Kev Moe, Zach Brown, Allison Krauss, Train, and Buena Vista Social Club. I'm grateful that I was able to see him several times in 2020, including exactly one month before he died, and to be able to give him a hug and tell him how much I love him. I will hold him forever in my head and my heart. I truly believe that he lives on in all of us and in the memories we have and hold to. Oh, now I have to keep going. All right. So this is a poem adapted from Anonymous. You can shed tears that he is gone, or you can smile that she has lived. You can close your eyes and pray that he will come back, or you can open your eyes and see all that he has left. Your heart can be empty because you can't see him, or you can be full of the love that you share. You can turn your back on tomorrow and live yesterday, or you can be happy for tomorrow because of yesterday. You can remember him and only that he is gone, or you can cherish his memory and let it live on. You can cry and close your mind, be empty and turn your back, or you can do what you would want. Smile, open your eyes, love, and go on. So I'm wondering how people would feel about skipping the Quaker style sharing, because I sort of underestimated how much everybody would have to say, which was a mistake, of course, because everybody wants to talk about Jim. But um, we, I was thinking this would be about an hour and we're getting more for an hour and a half without the sharing, which can sometimes go on and on and on and on. So would people be okay if we didn't do the open-ended sharing? We've heard from a lot of people. I know everybody would probably like to say something, but what maybe we could do is if people want to share their memories of Jim, if you could write things out and send them to me and I'll kind of like collect it and distribute it that way if people are okay with that. Good? Or, okay, uh, good. you know, those of things who are here and talk to talk. Yes, at the reception. <laughs> Thank you for being flexible and uh, do a little screen share here, real quick. So, our sons, our sons, I need to turn mine up. Our sons uh, couldn't be here, but I want to bring them into the mix here with a, a song by Pete Seeger, which is one of our favorite songs to sing. Uh, at the, the death of a, a loved one. So I hope I can, I hope I can do this and have it sound okay. This is from when they were seniors in high school. To my old and to my
a couple last things to do. So I think the very first thing that I thought of including in this ceremony was this secular Kaddish that I've always loved. Maybe some of you will recognize it. And um, actually, Margot's original remarks had quoted this. And then when she found out that we were going to include this, uh, I don't need to also say it. So please uh, say the uh, bold parts as a responsorial reading. And some of you who are more traditional Jews will recognize where this comes from and how it's been adapted. At the rising of the sun and at its going down, we remember them. At the blowing of the wind and in the chill of winter, we remember them. At the opening of the buds and in the rebirth of spring, we remember them. At the blueness of the skies and in the warmth of summer, we remember them. At the rustling of the leaves and in the beauty of the autumn, we remember them. At the beginning of the year and when it ends, we remember them. As long as we live, they too will live, for they are a part of us as we remember them. Those who taught us to laugh and who taught us to cry, we remember them. Those who held us and whom we held, we remember them. Those who loved us and whom we loved, we remember them. As long as we live, they too will live, for they are part of us as we remember them. When we are weary and in need of strength, we remember them. When we are lost and sick at heart, we remember them. When we have decisions that are difficult to make, we remember them. When we have joys we yearn to share, we remember them. When we have achievements that are based on theirs, we remember them. As long as we live, they choose to live, for they are a part of us as we remember. One last song, which is another one we often like to, to sing with Jim. And I'll just, um, I'm just going to do this so people can see that here. this here. <laughs> okay. And I, I, I had thought of saying something myself besides introducing songs and stuff, but I, I felt like there was enough talking and people covered most of the important things. But I did want to just address. You know, I know a lot of us have been wanting to do something to remember Jim and it's a while after he died, you know, it's October 2020 and now it's, you know, June 2022 and some people might think, well, you know, it's kind of a long time, why would you even do this, but I, I felt like it was important for us to actually get together physically and, 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 and also virtually, it's nice to have the best of both worlds, um, but you know, Obviously, there's a lot of love for our dad, and uh, you know, I, I just think we needed this, and I did it anyway. So, and the fact that you came hopefully means that you did too. Um, and uh, and we really appreciate all of the love and support. And of course, there's been so much loss over this last couple of years, and so many people who have you know had these holes in their lives, uh, and for various reasons. And uh, but, you know, COVID is obviously one of them. Um, so. Uh, you know, it's not like our situation is unique by any stretch of the imagination, but I do think, you know, we, we do need these times to come together and, and be able to share our memories and our joys, but also our mourning and our grief. Um, and I also just want to uh, thank um, Cass for being there for my mother and, and being a support. And uh, it's not always easy to come into our family. Uh, but I think probably never is. Uh, so <laughs> no problem at all. <laughs> Okay, so this song is called Satisfied Mind. I didn't put the words in the program, but I know some of you will be able to sing along with it. Satisfied mind. 
Once I was lucky in fortune and fame. I had all that I needed to make a start in life's game. Then suddenly it happened. I lost every time. But I'm richer by far. With satisfied mind. For money can buy back your youth when you're born. For a friend when you're lonely, or a heart that's grown cold, the wealthiest person is a proper ally compared to the one with a satisfied mind. Downstairs, I believe, so hopefully you'll join us down there. And thank you all for coming. This was wonderful.